Hey class, so the next section of the introduction, your book kind of talks about it, but I'm going to talk about it in more detail, is the formal language of art. Now it's kind of funny to say a language like I thought about, I said before, but the visual arts kind of have their own language. Artists think in those terms, like musicians would think in sound, or mathematicians would think in numbers, and there's sort of a basic visual vocabulary that we're going to talk about. Um, it's things like formal elements like line, shape, space, color, value, which is light and dark, and then maybe some other terms you hear pretty often, as well as like principles of design, a few of those as well. First up is this word you'll hear a lot, composition. So, it is the overall plan or structure and the relationship between the different component parts. So, what would that be in here? This big red square is in relationship to the different squares and also in relationship to the lines. Mondrian has a really basic composition and he likes to think about his art like jazz, so he's playing it out like that. And it's a formal element arrangement. So what kinds of things would we think of this as formal elements? Red, yellow, blue, white, and black being formal colors. Very flat colors, right? There's a line, black line. And that's about it. He's very simple. Formal elements are distinct from things like subject matter, content, and theme. They're the actual physical look of things, right? Texture is a formal element. We'll talk about different versions, but that gives you the idea of composition. We hear this word form a lot. It's both shape and structure. So there's a, there's a definition up here from the Tate Gallery has good art definitions at its museum. So in relation to art, the term has two meanings. It can refer to the overall form taken by the work, its physical nature, or within a work of art, it can refer to the element of shape among the various elements. So the form of this is overall, and then we could talk about individual forms. This is Henry Moore, a simple uh, figure reclining in his style. Okay, so it's shape and structure together. It's three-dimensional and two-dimensional forms. To combine elements in a characteristic way is the definition of style. So this would be someone's style. Very famous painting. This is not the name of it. That's a mistake. Um, but nonetheless, Van Gogh has a certain style. Quick little bursts of color, brush strokes that are very thick, impasto, which is thick paint. He's post-impressionistic, post right? So you can identify people's work by their style a lot of the time. Now, in art, there's principles and formal elements. Elements would be line, shape or form, color, value, which is lightness and darkness, texture, and then space. Depending on who you're talking to, they might give it a couple different names, especially things like space. Um, and then 3D would have volume as part of space and a couple other things like planes. And then there's um, elements of it, which are pattern is not often used. It's texture or pattern. Um, repetition, would people would use pa pattern would say repetition as a principle. Rhythm proportion or scale, balance, unity, emphasis, so to speak, like focal points. These have a lot of different names. Um, some of them are, say, rhythm and repetition. This would be, some people don't include pattern. Some people would say movement. Emphasis could be focal point as well. So depending on which system of people you're talking to, you have different names a little bit. Principles. And elements are related like bricks are to architectural planes. Building blocks 
of the elements. Principles are how you design it and uh, get your idea across. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, I also want to point out here this architectural plan. These are called axonometric drawings. This is a floor plan, but the ones from Angles are. We're going to use those sometime when we talk about architecture because um, it's hard to show you the overall feeling of it without doing that. So that's what those are. A principle that I think is important for you guys to know about is balance. So there's different types of balance, but balance is the harmonious blending of the different elements to create a feeling of balance. Uh, there's symmetrical balance, asymmetrical, radial, bilateral, there's all different types, but mostly it's important to know about symmetry, which is if you drew a line down it any direction, but this way, one way, vertically, you get two sides that are basically the same, like mirrored. Asymmetrical balance is has a feeling of balance, but is off-kilter, also called informal balance. So this is a good example of that with Bernini. If you drew a line down it, it's not the same on each side, but it has a feeling of a whole that feels harmonious still. An element that you see a lot, a lot, a lot in work is line. Uh, if you think about line in one way, you could say it's actually the path of a moving point. All right? So even this mouse moving point going along is a line, right? Okay, so every line in some way or the other is a record of that. You have different qualities to it, right? Irregular, regular, they, they have a wavy dash, zigzag, spiral in relationships to each other. And this is kind of um, you know, it seems simple, but it can get interesting in different ways. But this is an example of sort of the same type of lines, but with a much different quality, depending on what kind of medium was applying them and how loose you're getting with like a pencil or pen and then ink on a brush, right? Line also is used to create facial expressions a long time, you know. Everyone throughout their whole life has probably at some point or another made a smiley face, right? And this idea is called pareidolia, where we actually want to see human faces in things. And we do it with all kinds of things like clouds, if you've ever looked up at the sky and saw a rabbit or something in the clouds, that would be a version of it. But this is a something I just want to point out unto itself that we want to see human faces and um, that that's part of kind of the way our brain works. So we'll notice that in work that oftentimes we see faces quickly, they become a focal point. The quality of line is even interesting because um, when we have lines that are straight and clear and regular, we would even use this as a figure of speech, like a hard liner or a clear line of thought. So these things go deep into our psyche and even our language and how we talk about things. So it's, it's really interesting how visuals get into figures of speech and the way we think about things even. Lines can be used for modeling light and dark values through hatching like that or through thicker material. This is charcoal. Still doing hashing but building up a tone. Okay, space, also an element. And we saw this earlier with the form, but we could talk about space as in the negative space. This one's playing with what's negative, but in this it would be the, spart the parts that are not the sculpture. And then the positive space, actual space. There's actual space in 3D objects, right? And then in 2D objects, it's illusion of space. This one's playing with the idea of what's the background, what's the foreground, what's the negative, what's the positive. Faces, vase, back and forth, back and forth, right? So that kind of just plays with the idea so you get the feeling of space right there. Plane is part of space and it's a flat surface, has a direction in it. 
So this would actually be um, 3D spaces of plane. We could think about the picture plane as well, the canvas or piece of paper or cloth that we actually make the pictorial image on. But in space, this is a plane. It's a work by Christo and John Claude, pretty interesting. Um, existed temporarily, so that's pretty interesting. Mass is 3D part of space, and that's the bulk density or weight of something. So it has a lot of mass. It's related to the idea of volume, which is also three-dimensional, but volume is an enclosed space a lot of times. But they get kind of tricky because they interrelate to each other a lot. So we could talk about the volume of something and the mass of it as part of space. Depth, or the illusion of depth in 2D, is also part of space. And this is using two-point perspective, a mathematical system um, that was developed in the Renaissance to create that feeling of depth by going to vanishing points that are way down here. So the artist is using this system that to create an idealistic sort of feeling of space. It shows something important though, which is that um, when spaces, when things get smaller or diminish as they go away, we feel them to be further away on a canvas or drawing. And that also eventually things over time converge if they're parallel to each other. So if you ever stood on a railroad track and then looked straight down, it converges at a certain point on the horizon. Different cultures show depth in different ways. And we'll see different ideas about depth or not caring about depth when we look at different art throughout the ages. Another important thing is foreshortened space. This is an example of that right here. Um, how the object, or in this case, feet of Christ, are moving closer to us. What's happening to them? Can you tell? It's reduction or distortion of parts represented that are not parallel to the picture plane to create a sense of 3D. What does that mean, reduction or distortion of parts? Represented objects. What is the represented object here? The feet? In the hands. They're not getting reduced, but what is getting reduced is some of the things in the background are becoming much smaller. If you see, this is the same size as that. Because it's the idea of these almost touching the picture plane or popping out, so things are getting changed in their size to create foreshortened space. Foreshortening is sometimes called so that's an idea of foreshortened space. We see this in a lot of uh, different paintings and things that are trying to show realistic depth and have things feel like they're popping out at you. Shape is an element. So it's lines that enclose space. It can be through paint or it could be through um, a line that gives you the feeling of the space enclosed or the solid color of it. It could be in 3D, a volume, so a shape that's 3D enclosing space. There's different types of space and shape. Um, there's a regular or biomorphic type of shapes, and then there's regular or geometric types of shapes. There's closed shapes, and then there's the idea of shape with an open part, which is like creating the line in our mind. Another important value, uh, element that we'll see is called value, which is the lightness or darkness of tones and also colors. So this middle gray color here is the same in every square. And depending on what it's around or what's around it, it feels darker or much lighter. And so value is something you see in relationship to other values in art. Texture is interesting. It can be actual texture, as in this object by Oppenheim. She's creating this kind of creepy cup that's covered with fur and a saucer and spoon. I say creepy because I always imagine it like my mustache is going into my mouth. Um, you wouldn't want to drink out of it. You'd feel like, ugh. But she's playing with the use and function of that and then texture messing with it. You wouldn't want a cup covered with fur, right? and then it becoming sort of another type of object. 
So this is an actual texture, right? The fur. And then there's an illusion of it in 2D when we create lines or painted lines or through um, paint or even we add something into the paint, maybe like sand, and then it becomes an actual texture on the painting. So there's a lot of kind of ways it can get interesting. Light and color. Color is an element. Light is how we see value and color. And this is a rainbow, so Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Um, light is a really interesting thing, and you know, you study it quite a bit in physics, and in physics too, they will study color. So this is an interesting area where science and art sort of overlap. It's a really powerful element, and the spectrum of visible colors is a really wide range of color, possible variations through paint even. Um, and when we're painting or drawing or like the, or using even stained glass pigments, we're kind of we're mixing pigments in a subtractive way. We add them to each other to make a color, and it absorbs the light that in every other color of light and reflects back the color that you see. It's very interesting. So you're mixing one another, one color with another. You're actually mixing wavelengths and light in a way. Um, some just general color terminology um, and so that you have an idea. I'm sure a lot of you know this already. Primary colors, red, yellow, blue, they can't be mixed. So that's why they're primary. Secondary colors are a mix of two primaries, so orange, purple, and green. And then there's something called tertiary colors, which is a primary with a secondary together makes a tertiary color. You can see it on this wheel here. The people, um, these are the tertiaries: yellow, green, orange, yellow, red, orange, red, purple, purple, blue, green, blue, green. This gives you an idea of that. This really, this wheel could just go thousands and millions of colors almost in between every little variation. A couple other words we use in color are hue, which is the family of color, value, which is the lightness and darkness. You can get it a tint by adding white, a shade by adding black, those are value, and intensity or saturation, um, which is like the muddiness or grayness or how pure the color would be. Okay. We like to sometimes talk about associated colors too. If you had to design, you would have red and yellow would make orange and so there's an so all the colors you could put in it that would be associated are yellow red and orange are all associated with each other this would be an example of painting doing a painting with that type of combination gives it a feeling of unity and then analogous colors which are by each other on the wheel this is an analogous color piece and then we could use the idea of monochrome, which is one color plus black and white. And people use that quite a bit. This is an interesting piece because it's all monochrome except for this little pop of red right here. And then the browns. This brown isn't. So this woman stands out quite a lot because everything else is monochrome. Another way that we talk about color is complementary colors. Not free like complementary but complementary they're opposite each other on the color wheel and so every one of them has a complementary this is how you make less saturated colors or less intensity because they gray each other out it's also how you make things pop out a lot so blue and orange christmas colors lakers colors denver broncos colors Complementary colors really pop out. They complement each other. And it's a way, like I said, to make browns or neutrals. And so you get a lot of blue and orange in this whole piece. There's other colors, but the majority of it is made from that. And in this piece, they're not making the colors all out of blue and orange, but he's using blue and orange, Wayne Tebald, to um, make things pop out a lot. So you think this is yellow, but it's actually a, type, a light orange. And the shadows are actually blue. And so things are really popping out and you're feeling a movement and rhythm throughout the piece because of the use of complementary colors in it. 
It's very expressive. Color is really powerful and has a lot of a quick feeling for people when they're looking at things. And it's also a way of reinforcing content. This is the fall of man, uh, son of man by Magritte. And he's making us focus a lot on the apple because the red and green are opposite each other. So he's using it to reinforce what he wants you to see, that his face is covered by an apple. We're going to look, look at another couple bits of information, all stylistic terminologies. I want to go back real quick here and say part of the psychology of color is also red and warm colors kind of have a sense of fire, um, paying attention, the red flag, the red carpet, and also happiness or warmth. Blue has a sort of feeling of relaxation, cool, water, stability. And you have a lot of these type of things even in figures of speech like green with envy or having the blues is being sad, right? So there's a lot of um, uses of color terminology to kind of express emotion. And so I think that's something to think about when we see color used. Okay, let's go forward into this stylistic terminologies. There's a list of some of them that we're going to be talking about. Subject matter. When we talk about subject matter, we're talking about what the piece is showing represented in the art. Not the content, but what you see. So in this in this piece, it's represented of a knot. Louise Bourgeois has a knot because she used to have to repair tapestry is made out of marble, so it's a marble knot on top of a, a um, rock. But the content is a bit more than that because it goes into her childhood and what she used to have to do and all other sorts of things. So content is the themes, value, or ideas that come out of the subject matter and the form. It's distinctive from form and subject matter. It is the thing that's created by what you show and how you show it. So Mona Lisa Warhol, he's famous for doing repetitions of things and silk string, right? What's he maybe trying to say here? Think about this for a second with me. He's changing a famous, famous painting that's a one of a kind, right? And he's showing different parts of it and variations of it and messing with it. So he's talking about degradation of image, repetition, over repetition, and all sorts of interesting things that are way bigger than just the Mona Lisa. So that would be the content. He's got the subject matter of the Mona Lisa, he's got the forms of silkscreen, which is using black and white and green, and the forms of these spaces sort of looking like they're getting washed out, right? But the content is behind all that. Or we should say pushing forward and being created by all of that. We have representation as a word people will talk about representational or figurative. So that is, people sometimes use this word figurative to talk about the figure or pe figures of people, and that's fine. But really what it is meant to be is that it's recognizable natural forms, okay? either natural or created objects, but they're recognizable, they're representational. So we can tell what we can tell that they're some kind of created or natural form recognizable, but it doesn't have to be realistic to be representational. It's more like representational is the opposite of non-representational, so things we can't tell what they are. Now, naturalistic is kind of a step up in that it's depicting it more or less as we would see them. So the difference is something could be representational, but not natural, really, how we would see them. So that's basic idea of naturalistic. I picked this piece to show you because it's enamel paint on plaster sculpture. So it's not like super real, real, but they're more or less, you know, how we would see cakes and things like that. Realistic is taking it up another notch. So naturalistic, realistic is resembling the actual appearance rather than distortion or abstraction. So this has still some distortion in it. 
this is realistic how it would actually appear. Van Eyck self-portrait. He looks like that. And then illusionistic is even more convincing. So convincing that reality or the feeling of reality is achieved. Chuck Close drawing with charcoal. He looks like he's got a photograph of himself. Look at the detail and little, little things. These are slip casts, which is clay being put into mold and made. So it feels like we're looking at a real stack of cards on a book, but that is clay. So that's illusionistic. To kind of show you the difference between illusionistic and naturalistic, here we go. So there's a wide spectrum there. And we use the terms to kind of, um, in contrast to each other, I guess, is a way to think about them. Idealized. That's depicting accepted standards of beauty. So when something's been idealized, it's, it's the accepted standard of beauty or the ideal that it's meant to be. We see this a lot in ancient Greek art. Um, for example, we'll be looking at and I would say real quick on that, it's accepted standards of beauty for the particular culture and the particular place and time, not necessarily for us still today. But we would have one in our society as well. Stylized, we see this a lot, and we'll talk about this as a term in quite a bit of the work we see in this course. And it's where certain features... Um, become as though they're non-organic surface elements. So in this piece, we have the fur on the she-wolf, and it's being stylized because it's, it's geometric. It's becoming like a surface element that's no longer organic. So that's a good, a good representation of stylization happening. Romanticized, we see this quite a bit in work, but it's basically depicting nostalgic, emotional, fantasful, or mysterious things. And this one is sort of emotional and, and nostalgic. It's a revolution, and the person here is throwing their arms up. He's exaggerated in scale. He's almost as large as these people, but he's on his knees. And you would say, based on this, that the artist is definitely in favor of the people who are the revolutionaries, not the people who are the firing squad. Um, it's romanticizing the heroism of the revolution. Right? Depending on which side you're on, this could be very much considered a propaganda piece, or you could be stoked about it and think, yeah, I agree with that. I'm for the revolution. Right? Non-representational as opposed to representation, right? The opposite of it is you really, really can't tell what it is. So it's opposite of figurative. It could be also called non-figurative. Depicting, it's not depicting objects or, or figures. We don't know what it is. It's non-representational. Now, a lot of times in this type of work, people um, try to see things and they maybe do like pareidolia with faces, they kind of try to start to see different things and make meaning out of it, but the artist's intention here is to not have any representation. Can it actually happen? I don't know. Uh, a lot of argument about that. But we could say, in the very least, maybe it's representing their minds, right? So then that would be the undoing of it, but we're getting into territory that I don't want to get into. Abstraction. So this is describing forms not actually depicting real objects it's sort of the essence of the object so it describes the form in a way that's not really real this is a picture of a cow this is an abstraction of a cow the subject matter could be recognizable making the work representational but it's more of a non-naturalistic form so in this one the subject matter of the cow is recognizable but it's not naturalistic it's been abstracted it's been changed um, to be non-naturalistic and kind of convey an essence of the cow it's on a spectrum you could say from representation to non-representation 
An abstraction is a bunch of steps in between. We have before us the cow. Okay. Most real photographic realism, illusionism. And then there's different levels of drawing in this cow. This is a piece of Theo van Doesburg's transition from naturalism, so this is not realism, to a painting at the end of it, which is non-representational, but based off of the cow. He's a Dutch artist, um, and this is kind of how he made his work. So he was interested in this non-representational work. Sometimes for us nowadays, it's or people love it, and a lot of other people kind of hate this type of work. But this is that just to show you um, the way in which some artists work and to explain some of the terms for you. So just another side note, some people would call this pure abstraction. So it could be called pure abstraction, non-representational, or non-figurative. And then they, this up here could be called figurative or naturalistic or representational. So the words kind of correspond to each other, representational, non-representational, figurative, non-figurative. Okay, so they're in binaries that can maybe help you understand them, and they're in stages, shall we say. All right, so that wraps us up for the terminology, which is the part two of the introduction, to help you guys have some clear ideas about um, some of this, at least get you started in using language that will help you in your writing and talking and thinking about the work. So next up, our next lectures, we'll start talking about the chapter Paleolithic Art, and um, we'll be looking at the ancient, ancient, the longest, the go stuff that's the longest ago, farthest back, I guess is a better way to say that, in our um, from us right now. All right, take care, guys. Hopefully you're staying well out there.